giving birth to a national monument. Why some West Virginians are working so hard to protect this place forever. The prairie chicken is a fun bird to watch when they do their mating ritual. But this prairie bird has lost 90% of its range in recent years. We'll show you some innovative efforts underway to save the troubled prairie chicken. These high school kids are planting, digging, and learning in a whole new way. No one said it was going to be easy. <laughs> and fast-moving gators meet fast-moving scientists. Collecting DNA can sometimes get a little dicey. Whoa! From the swale, to the prairie, to the swamp. The journey starts now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm Caroline Ravel. We've got some terrific stories for you today on the conservation of America's landscapes, waters, and wildlife. And I'm Bruce Burkhardt in the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia home to the Cranberry Wilderness Area, which is the largest national forest wilderness area in the eastern part of the U.S. And the people who live here and are proud of its unique heritage are making a monumental effort to turn this place into a monument, a national monument. There's a physical comfort inside the mountain. There's also a sense of community. This is a land where people work together to build, and that's part of what is great about this rural part of Appalachia. You could say a river runs through it, but it'd be more accurate to say six rivers run through it. That's why they call this place the birthplace of rivers. We are trying to designate the birthplace of Rivers National Monument on the Monongahela National Forest. There are six spectacular rivers that begin right here on this very landscape. These are rivers that West Virginians know and love, like the Cranberry River and the Williams River, where people grew up. What all national monuments have in common is that they aim to provide strong statutory protections to the resources that have been identified as something so special on a national scale. That they deserve that designation, they deserve that protection for future generations. 0.007%, a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the world's water is directly available to humans for consumption. That's this water right here is that fraction of a fraction of a percent. So it is this responsibility we have to make sure that this area is protected. Communities depend on these rivers and the quality of these rivers, not just here on this landscape. The headwaters in this region are so critical to water quality to all those who live downstream. I liken it to a newborn baby. Parents of a newborn are bestowed this responsibility upon them to care for and protect this very fragile, vulnerable being. And I think of headwaters that way. The landscape up there is transplanted from really another time in history. We talk about you know being in the mountains, but then here in these little places that uh, seem almost more tropical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the you know the forests around this part of uh, the Monongahela, this part of West Virginia, they sort of have this you know historic or even prehistoric feel to them. stuff that you don't normally see in in other parts of West Virginia. So it's really kind of special environment. One thing I didn't expect to find here was Canada. Well, not really Canada, but the Cranberry Glades is a unique ecosystem, a large bog not usually found this far south. 
You know, not a lot of people associate cranberries with the mountains of West Virginia, but it's it's one of those northern species that's found its way here to this you know super unique biodiversity hotspot. We're in such a remote part of the Mid-Atlantic and Eastern U.S. that any time that we can develop a sustainable tourism economy, I think it's, it's a good long-term future. A lot of tourists that come through here have come back to revisit every day. Almost every day you have somebody come into this building who was here 30 years ago with their grandmother or came here and spent summers here, or you know, was bringing their kids back to see where they grew up and spent their summer. You know, so this is a lot of people's history. I want to make sure that my kids get a chance to experience exactly the same thing that I got to experience, and my great, 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 great grandchildren get to experience the same thing. And this is where I grew up fishing. This is where thousands of people have grown up fishing. It's really the core trout fishing experience for all West Virginians. Aside from protecting the landscape and sort of providing those natural resource-based protections that you know, we want the monument to achieve, there's also this whole economic story to be told about the benefits of this landscape to local communities. We're struggling, have been struggling historically. Um, we have one of the lowest median incomes in the country. So to have a chance to diversify our economic base, to see our tourism industry grow, in a way that honors the land and honors the water. It's a win-win situation. Let's build on our strengths and tourism, natural beauty, clean water, healthy forest. These are our strengths. These are things that other counties and other states around us don't have the abundance of. And people look at this landscape and they know that it's already here and we already have this resource and it's not something that we have to buy or invest a lot of money in. All we have to do is to say that, yes, to decision makers that we want this area to be permanently preserved, you know, to say that this landscape that's in our own backyards here is so special that it should be on the map. It's about protecting our, our resources for future generations. Looking down the road, how clean will this water be in 50 years if we don't have federal protection? I think the coalition that has been built around this initiative is really making decision makers pay attention. Varying missions from different organizations that are kind of scattered and going different directions all the time and everybody comes together on this common goal and we all have something in common when it comes to something like this monument. We share a common interest in water. We are drawn toward water because it brings peace to us. It enhances our quality of life. We just enjoy all of its uses. The birthplace of rivers is very important to us. The government can you know, make this designation and say this is gonna stay like this. And that's important to me. It's very important, I think, that people are able to experience what this part of the country has to offer. To be able to drive on the scenic highway and look both ways and just see ridges of green and woods this time of year. To feel that expansiveness, I think people will find that the communities in this area also understand the value and want to share that because this is something that should be shared. If that's not a monument, I don't know what is. Now we'll take another look at how private landowners are getting helpful support from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, not only to protect soils and water, but also to save threatened or endangered species of wildlife. To get this story, we sent our crews to both Delaware and Western Kansas to see what's being done to conserve bog turtles and lesser prairie chickens. About 70% of the land in the lower 48 states is owned by private individuals. And we believe that the fate of the environment really depends on the quality of the decisions made by the men and women who own and operate that land. My name is Dave White. I'm the chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service. 
be season long grazing. Time. NRCS is a USDA agency. We have about 2,900 field offices and we have people all over the country that are agronomists, biologists, engineers. This is Working Lands for Wildlife, uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative. And these technical people work one on one with producers to solve natural resource problems. Maybe spread the maps out over here. And... My name is Roy Bealey, and I'm a rancher here in Comanche County, Kansas. This photo here is probably taken in the early 1900s. My great great grandfather, he homesteaded here and started this place, and I'm fifth generation, and hopefully keep continuing on down the line with my children. <laughs> Love the outdoors and the solitude and raising you know, cow calf, taking care of them has just kind of always been a, a part of our lifestyle. The prairie chicken is a fun bird to watch in the early spring when they do their uh, mating ritual. Yeah, there's always been prairie chickens around. I think their numbers have declined. The lesser prairie chicken is a native game bird of the southern Great Plains of the United States. I'm Christian Hagen, and I'm the science advisor to the Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative for the NRCS. This bird once occupied uh, vast areas of a five-state region. Since European settlement, that range has been largely contracted by about 90%. Because of that contraction, we've actually seen that species listed as a candidate for protection under the Endangered Species Act. So this is the eastern red cedar. Historically, large herds of bison and periodic fire kept this tree at bay. This tree is now occurring in areas large enough that it's actually displacing or removing habitat for native species like the lesser prairie chicken. So as simple and funny as it sounds, prairie chickens are a prairie species. And so plants like a, a cedar tree uh, represent a habitat that the bird will simply not use. But even at lower densities, what this does is it actually provides predators, things like the coyote and the hawk, it provides them an extra advantage and may actually increase the predation rates on the prairie chicken. So the, the wonderful thing that happens when you remove these trees is we're really returning the prairie to its historic condition. Trees and the chickens don't get along very good, and the cedars, they also use groundwater that would take away from grass production. They're just not enough grass for the livestock operation. This cedar here was about 10 years old mechanical clearing is about the only way to, to get on top of something like this. These people have to make money off the, off the cattle ranching business. I'm Dusty Taha, Rangeland Management Specialist with Natural Resources Conservation Service in South Central Kansas. All right, so that's the North contract. We help landowners by providing them a, a prescribed grazing plan. The program in, includes financial assistance in, in brush clearing as well as uh, grazing incentive payments. And I mean, them chickens are all kind of through this area. And we know there's chickens here on, on this ranch. Um, we hope to increase their numbers and hopefully Roy will, Roy will see that happening. Hopefully also he'll see that, that the rotational grazing program will pay off in benefits in the, in the ranching business as well. I don't see the, these as restrictions. I believe that a guy needs to, should take care of his operation regardless uh, the involvement of NRCS. Our major, major goal is to just to be profitable. What the Fish and Wildlife Service has done is, is they said if a, a farmer, rancher works with us, develops a conservation plan, implements those conservation practices, they will give them certainty from regulation for up to 30 years. We've taken the fear out of the Endangered Species Act, and not just for today or tomorrow, but for a generation, for 30 years. It's not about a, a bird or a turtle. This is about changing the whole paradigm of how we deal with the Endangered Species Act in America. You can go to the left, I can go to the right. I think all species are important to protect. They're also important to protect their habitats. 
My name is Holly Niederreiter. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Delaware Division of Fish and Wildlife in the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. This is like the perfect nesting spot for a turtle. The main thing that we're trying to do is protect bog turtles. The bog turtle is the smallest turtle in North America. It's about the size of the palm of your hand as an adult. It's the color of the mud in which it lives. So far what we've found is that turtles aren't doing well in Delaware. Um, we've really done an aggressive search for new habitats and we found new habitats, but we're not finding turtles in any of those sites. So that's really disappointing. No turtles today. You know, we don't know exactly what happened to those populations, but what's happened around those is there's been a lot of development. And when you put in something like a whole housing development, that changes the hydrology of the whole area. Um, and it, if it doesn't actually fill the wetland itself, it can end up just pulling the water away from it. There are definitely some landowners who really don't want endangered species on their property. There is a, a lot of fear surrounding the Endangered Species Act. And that's one of the things we wanted to overcome with that, to change it from confrontation to collaboration. So if we control the vegetation here, what I'm hoping is that we can get more of the open canopy areas where the, the turtles can nest and hopefully have a higher reproduction. If a producer does everything they can to protect a bog turtle, we are not going to come in and require you to do anything more. So that producer knows there's nobody going to mess with them. They have the certainty that they've done what they needed to do. We found a way that brings people together. We can give good value to the taxpayer. We can save these species. We can make sure that our farmers and ranchers economically survive, and we can do it in harmony with a quality environment. Ever hear of a bioswale? Well, it's a natural way to clean up water using plants as filters. Some students in Albany, Oregon are building one at their high school, and they're learning a lot of environmental lessons along the way. What was the thing that we know about rushes and sedges? Rushes are round and sedges have edges. A lot of learning takes yeah, place in this science class really at Albany cool Option practice. School in Oregon. Okay, coming through. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to break it. <laughs> but the knowledge really soaks in out here. Kelly Muller's ecology class is creating a bioswale to filter oily runoff from the parking lot. <laughs> There's some trash in our headwaters here. Someone could grab that out. Doesn't look like a lot yet, but give it a few years. <laughs> I think we have maybe 10 plants to plant, but we have a lot of mulch to move, some cardboard to put down, and tools to move to the new tool shed. We have Knick Knick here. All of these little ones are connect to Nick, and that's Camus. We have sedges and rushes and red twig dogwood in the back. On top of this berm, you can put the mulch, and then over here as well to the edge where that sod is. Shovels and then spread with rakes. No one said it was going to be easy. <laughs> yeah. Deciduous or an evergreen. <laughs> evergreen. 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 Oh. I don't know. I don't know. Needles. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think that now that I have ecology class, I like to like be outside more and experience nature more because I feel like I know so much more about it. And so the idea with these swales is to create sort of a, a biofilter where you're coming down and this water is being forced into a certain area where these plants are positioned to help with the breakdown of those pollutants. <laughs> Rushes and sedges have the ability to do that. Landscaper Mike Nell selected the most efficient native plants for the task. This is our state flower, this is Oregon grape. He also shares his time and expertise. This is Ribes sanguinium. This is a red flowering currant. In three or four years, this should all fill in really nicely and provide some habitat for all sorts of birds and insects and invertebrates in the water there. Master Gardener right there. A grant from the Captain Planet Foundation is helping with this transformation. There's new growth in the plants, in some ways, and these young people too. I like getting my hands dirty and just 
turning all the dirt. It's kind of fun. At normal school, you don't get to go play in the dirt and get a grade for it. And here you get to have fun, plant stuff, and actually better the environment. Once they get out here, they really like what they're doing, and they're just really proud of um, their accomplishments. Some of these kids have faced bullying, scrapes with the law, and homelessness. Small classes and hands-on learning are leading them to promising new opportunities. I love seeing them kind of change their attitudes towards us, towards education, towards their future. For many students, they hated school, but they love a college class. It's nice to see them also and be like, oh, you know, I really, really enjoyed doing the Green School Project here. I really enjoyed working out in the bioswale or the school garden. Maybe I'll go into landscaping. Focusing on college, you know, bettering myself as a person, keeping my nose clean, staying out of trouble, and trying to make an impact on people, you know, always trying to help other people. Being outside and just getting fresh air and realizing that if it's clean out here, that people can come and be proud that it's our school and be proud that people can share that in our community. It puts kids in touch with environmental professionals or with industry professionals and gives them a chance to learn about what the industries are doing and what their government is doing with water quality. From the city of Albany to local watershed councils, the community is investing in these students. And our board really recognized educating uh, the next generation about the importance of the outdoors as our number one priority. Then we're gonna have solar panels put um, in the front of the building. I've been uh, a traditional high school teacher, traditional high school administrator, but I've always identified with, with the students that uh, need an alternative path. I'm Dan Knight, I'm principal at Albany Option School. We try to have a family feel here where we know the students, we know about the students and what their issues are so we can better serve them. We have a vegetable garden as well that we built last year and we had a class that built the raised beds for it and then my biology class did the planting and we were serving cucumbers and strawberries and tomatoes and onions and we donated food to the foods class and it just kind of snowballed from there. The kids just loved it and they loved being able to say yeah I grew that and doesn't it taste great? The garden and bioswale have led to other projects volunteering to teach younger children about the environment a genuine desire to be conscious, eco-literate citizens. What I do in my ecology class is a topic a day, issues facing the environment or humans in the environment. I just want to try to make as many kids as I can aware of these issues and that they're out there and then this is their planet. What you do will make the difference in the future. and alligators haven't changed much in millions of years, but their habitat certainly has. Some daring biologists are trying to wrestle some answers from these reptiles and their DNA that may provide some insight into human genetics. Miles O'Brien has more in our Science Nation report. Get yourself ready to go before you release those jaws. So this field trip was basically to collect samples for a population genetic survey of, of alligators. When biologist David Ray is in the field, it's both science and adventure. The important thing to do here, even on a small one like this, is to keep that head in control. With support from the National Science Foundation, Ray and his team at Mississippi State University are mapping crocodile and alligator genomes. These reptiles have changed little over the past 300 million Whoa. years or so. Ray is itching to see the genetic blueprints, especially since these animals are the closest living ancestors to today's birds. Crocodilians are interesting from an evolutionary standpoint. Their genomes are doing the same thing their bodies are doing. They're evolving very, very slowly. Birds and crocodilians, though you wouldn't think it from looking at them, are each other's closest existing relative. Genomics could help save endangered species, like the Indian gharial, Scientists could identify the most diverse animals in the gene pool, then breed them. The more we can understand about the way their genomes are put together, the more likely we are to understand how we can keep them from going extinct. Can we see somebody? There we go. This is an eastern pipistrelle. Another aspect of his research takes him to the bat cave. These are actually the finger bones. Ray's team studies genes called transposable elements in bats and other animals. These so-called jumping genes can copy themselves and literally jump around in a DNA sequence. 
better understanding of them could lead to improved genetic therapies in the future. These transposable elements contributed many of the regulatory elements that tell a gene when to turn on and turn off. And so the fact that these things can move from place to place lets us understand better how genes are regulated, how we can change the regulation of genes. The crocs, bats, and other creatures that raise team studies may not be the easiest to catch, but understanding their genes is a subject worth wrestling with. And now here's a quick look at a story from our next show. Our people believe that they came from the ground and we live in the fourth world. The environment, the land, Mother Earth sustains human being. It's food, medicine, a place of worship. It's heaven on earth. As Native Americans, in our heart, in our soul, we believe that the land belongs to us. Thanks for joining us on This American Land. And remember, you can catch us anytime at thisamericanland.org. We'd love to hear your comments or hear your ideas for stories you think we should cover. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Turner Foundation.